from the archives of the greatest dramas in radio history, we proudly present Hollywood. The Radio Theater brings you Greer Garson and Walter Pidgeon in Madame Curie. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. You've heard a great deal lately about a magic substance called uranium, the key to radioactivity and atomic power. Yet half a century ago, from that same substance, came a discovery that promised untold benefits to man and added greatly to our knowledge of atomic energy. Our play tonight from Metro-Golden-Mare's epic screenplay, Madame Curie, deals not only with that thrilling search for radium, but with a man and woman whose love for each other was as great as their love for humanity and truth, and who fought for both with sacrifice and courage. Little wonder that this drama called for two of the screen's outstanding stars, Greer Garson and Walter Pidgeon who tonight appear in their original roles as Madame Curie and Pierre, her husband. The greatest roles, I think, that we've ever seen them in together. On with our play and the first act of Madame Curie, starring Greer Garson in the title role and Walter Pigeon as Pierre. Paris in the 1890s. At the world-famous Sorbonne University, Professor Perrault is lecturing to a group of students. Among them, in Tantaniga, is a young girl, Marie Sklodowska. Go out alone into space. Go out alone. Learn to be alone with nature. With a ray of light, a drop of rain, a piece of earth. Then you'll learn to think alone, as they did. Men like Newton, Galileo, Probably it will not be your good fortune to reach so high to catch a star on your fingertips, but the rewards of investigation, star. of exploration... To catch a star on your fingertips. Not far from the university is the scientific laboratory of Dr. Pierre Curie where Dr. Curie has just disclosed a highly unscientific opinion. What? What was that you said, Doctor? I said, David, that tea parties are an instrument of the devil. Oh. Oh, yes, sir. And I am a fool. I must be polite but firm. Polite but firm, yes, definitely. But if I've done something wrong, no, sir... No, 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 not you, David, no. I went to a tea party yesterday at Professor Perot's. As a result, a pupil of Perot's will be working with us for a short time. Oh, yes, sir. A special assignment in physics. Well, that should be very interesting, sir. Unfortunately, the pupil is a girl. A girl, sir? Yes, Polish. I've uh, got it written down here somewhere. Oh, yes, here we are. Marie Stadowska. She's a girl. Oh, and women scientists are particularly unattractive, sir. Well, well I didn't know it and, until it was too late. In the world of abstract research, David, woman is a menace. Oh, there's no doubt of it, sir. So uh, put Miss um, uh, Stradowska in the corner over there and, and be sure to inform her how very important silence is to laboratory concentration. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, the magnetometer in the storeroom. Perot says she'll need one. I'll get it now, sir. I'm very sorry for your troubles, Dr. Curie. Thank you, David. I beg your pardon. Oh, I'm looking for Dr. Curie's laboratory. You're looking for... But you're not. I mean, you can't be. Well, well, I'm Dr. Curie's assistant. Then perhaps you'll direct me, please. Well, I certainly will. I certainly will. Well, now, what do you think of that? You know, Dr. Curie has asked me to look out for you. Oh? Oh, indeed. Well, here we are. Here she is, Dr. Curie. Ran straight into her, the first thing. Uh, oh, uh, good morning, mademoiselle. Good morning, Dr. Curie. Well, I'm sure David will see that you are properly installed, mademoiselle. I'm uh, quite absorbed with my work here, uh, as, as you can see. Dr. Curie, I appreciate this chance more than I can say. Not at all, not at all. 
And I do hope you'll be quite comfortable. Do you think this desk will do, mademoiselle? Oh, this is excellent, thank oh, you. Better get a little more light. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Curie. Quite all right. That still isn't enough light. Oh, please, please, don't bother. But Dr. Curie wants you to be comfortable. I'll just... Sorry, sir. Yes, David. I, uh, I'd better take off my hat and coat. Oh, allow me. I'll hang them up in the cupboard. Really, monsieur, there's no need to be... <laughs> Oh, I, I beg your pardon, Dr. Curie, just hanging up her coat. Oh, my office is just upstairs, mademoiselle. I hope you won't hesitate to call on me it's if... Very kind. Oh, and I better give you some advice where to eat around here. Really, monsieur, I don't think we should talk. Dr. Curie... Well, I just thought I, I, you'd like that? to know where to eat. But please... I'll take I you there today talk. myself. It's no trouble at all. Uh... Oh, uh... Sorry, Dr. Curie. Whistling. He knows I abominate whistling in the laboratory. I, uh, I'll try to be as inconspicuous as possible, Dr. Curie. That will be very kind of you, mademoiselle. Very kind. Oh, uh, mademoiselle. Good evening, Dr. Curie. Uh, standing here in the entrance? The rain... I was waiting for it to stop. Rain? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Well, uh, good evening. Oh, uh, uh, but but you have no umbrella, mademoiselle. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps I can help you. Oh, I don't want to trouble you, thank oh, you. No, no trouble at all, no trouble at all. Well, thank you, you're very kind. Not at all, mademoiselle. I'll be very happy to accompany you to your lodging. May I ask another question, Dr. Curie? It's a simple matter, but I, I find it very puzzling. Yes? In the symmetry L sub Q and 2L sub Q, you include only those rotations which are integral multiples of 2 pi over Q. But uh, 2 pi times K over Q excludes the identity transformation if K is not an integer. Yes, for the finite K, that applies. Well? But in the limit L sub infinity, uh, a difficulty seems... I, I, I don't see why. Well, if you consider the matter rigorously, I think... Oh, this is where I live. Oh, yes, I, I think I see what you mean, mademoiselle. Well, hmm, I, I'll have to look into this. Goodbye, Dr. Curie. Thank you. Of course, of course. Uh, oh, uh, uh, mademoiselle, may I say your conversation is very scintillating? Oh, thank you. Hmm. An extremely daring hypothesis. I must... Uh, you want to get killed? Uh, what is uh, what you're doing? Oh, oh. Uh -huh. I beg your pardon. Yeah. In the limit L sub infinity. Limit L sub infinity. Yes, yes, of course, of course. Of course. Uh, Good morning, mademoiselle. Good morning, Dr. Curie. I, uh, I've uh, just uh, been to my publishers. Uh, my book, it's, it's just off the press. Oh, how proud you must be. I, uh, I thought perhaps you might like to have a copy. I would, very much. Well, then, uh, it, this is yours, mademoiselle. Oh, thank you. Oh, not at all, not at all. Uh, oh, uh, uh, the book, mademoiselle. Yes? Uh, I, I uh, inscribed the book to you on the, uh, on the flyleaf. Oh, to Mademoiselle Sklodowska, with, with the respect and friendship of the author. I believe that's the usual procedure. I'm very flattered, Dr. Curie. Oh, uh, not at all, not at all. Oh, Dr. Becquerel. I hope I'm not intruding, Curie, but could you step over to my laboratory? I think I've happened on something of great interest. Of course. Uh, what is it? Uh, aren't you uh, coming, Mademoiselle? If I may. You don't mind, Doctor, if Mademoiselle... Oh, no, 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 I'm delighted. I think you'll agree it's really most extraordinary. Oh, uh, this way, mademoiselle. I don't understand, Dr. Becquerel. This photographic plate obviously is light struck. Yes, light struck. But the amazing thing is that it became light struck lying in this drawer with a piece of rock. A closed drawer? Yes, in total darkness. But uh, how is that possible? I, I, I don't know. I didn't even know the rock was in the drawer with the photographic plate. But uh, then how do you explain... Now, that? look at this plate. This uh, was no accident. Uh -huh. This was deliberate. I took this second plate, placed a key on it, and over the key I set this same piece of rock. Now, what do you see? A picture of a key? That, that rock, Dr. Becquerel, may I ask what it is? It's called pitch blend, mademoiselle. You mean that pitch blend gives off rays? Rays powerful enough to affect a photographic plate? That, monsieur, must be so. Ah. Oh. 
incredible. It's as if there were a piece of the sun locked up in this rock. A piece of the sun locked up in a rock. I, I, I can't get it out of my head. I try to concentrate on my work, but it's impossible. Dr. Becquerel's discovery? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, how did you know? Because all week I've been thinking about it, too. What could it be? What could be the nature of the radiation? Perhaps we shall never know. It's a most exciting problem. David's promised to write to me and tell me how it develops. Write to you? Why? Because my work here is done, Doctor, and I'll be studying. My examinations come up in two weeks, you know. So soon? Well, I, I hadn't realized. It's the middle of June. Term is nearly over. The middle of June. Uh, you know... I always used to look forward to my summers in the country. My uh, parents have a small place at so. I used to take long walks through the woods there. Soon I shall be walking in the country. My father loves to walk. Your father? Uh, here in Paris? Oh, no, no, doctor. In Warsaw. Had you forgotten that I'm going back to Poland to teach? But I, well, uh, oh, I, I knew that was your idea, but, well, everything has changed now. You're making experiments of your own. I You're... know. I know, and I shall miss Paris. Oh, I, I hadn't planned on this at all. How, how can you abandon science when you're making such progress? You have talent, a very definite talent, and, and it's your duty to use it. Oh, mademoiselle, I, 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 I beg you to reconsider. It's very kind of you, Dr. Curie, but I'm afraid I, I can't give up the entire plan that I've had for so long. I thought, of course, that you knew. I do not understand how anyone with a scientific mind can entertain the thought of abandoning science. Dr. Curie, I had meant to ask you. I suppose you wouldn't care to attend my graduation? Well, uh, uh, I should enjoy very much seeing you get your degree, but, uh, well, uh, I have a... There's always such a crowd. Oh, I understand. I feel exactly the same way myself. Well, uh, I shall be coming back again, of course, to see to one or two things. Goodbye, Dr. Curie. Goodbye, mademoiselle. Come in. Dr. Curie. How do you do? Oh, please come in. Thank you. I, uh, I looked all over for you at the graduation ceremonies. You were there. Ah, uh, yes. I'm very proud of you, mademoiselle. First in your class in physics. Oh, thank you. I never dreamed that I would... I mean, I, I even was afraid that I, I mightn't even... I, oh, oh, I, oh, I am so glad that you were able to be there, Dr. Curie. Uh... You've uh, been packing. Yes, yes. I'm leaving for Poland on Tuesday. Oh, then you haven't reconsidered. I'm afraid not. Yes, I see. Uh, well, then I presume there'd be no time for uh, uh, something I had in mind. That is, I... Well, I thought it might be nice for you to take away with you something of the Paris countryside. I thought you uh, might like to spend the weekend with my parents. Oh. But, of course, I see that would be impossible because you'll be uh, busy... Uh, Packing and doing one thing and another, I suppose. Yes, the, the idea is quite preposterous. The idea is not preposterous at all. I should like to come very much. You would? Yes, thank you. Well, then. Uh, uh, well, then. This was Jacques' room when he was home. My brother's. Oh, it's charming. Uh, I hope you rest well, my dear. All I ever seem to say to the curies is thank you. Please let me say it again. Thank you for the lovely day. Really, you should stay, mademoiselle. We'd love to have you with us for a time. It's no use, mother. She's determined to go to Poland, and apparently, as far as she's concerned, science can be forgotten. I... I did try to explain to you. I thought you understood. Uh, I... I do understand. I'm sorry. Well, good night, my dear. Good night, Madame Curie. Good night, mademoiselle. Good night. Pierre, you shouldn't have spoken to her like that. She's a very obstinate girl, mother. What's that? Who's obstinate, me? No, Madame uh, uh, Sklodowska. Uh, saw that the first minute I clapped eyes on her. Won't listen to reason. Closes up her mind like a clam. And she's so intelligent about other things. Well, good night, mother, father. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Blind as a bat. Who? Who? Your son, of course. Jean, what's that? Someone's 
was walking about. That's your brilliant son. He's been pacing up and down in there for an hour. He's thinking. Thinking? What about? Does he ever think of anything but science? Oh, yes. I guess you're right. I'll never have a grandchild. Never. But of course. Why haven't I ever thought of that before? Mademoiselle! Mademoiselle Skidosha! Are you awake? Mademoiselle! What is it? Is there something wrong? Uh, ma'am... Oh. Excuse me. But... I, I find it impossible for you to leave Paris. But what, I know? No, 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 please. I, I, I must talk to you. Uh, during these past two weeks, when you've not been coming to the laboratory, I found everything very confusing. It's impossible to do my work. In short, it's, it's impossible to go on without you. But now, suddenly, something has become very clear to me. Uh, Mademoiselle, I am helpful to you in the studio, in the laboratory, am I not? Am I not? Didn't you say that? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, a, a, a few times I've been able to make suggestions which you have found valuable. Well, of course, Dr. Keeley. Well, then. Now, whereas I am inclined to be nervous and impatient, you, you, you are quite the opposite. You have a clear mind. You are tenacious. You will never give up. It's an excellent combination. I, I, I might compare it with the chemical formula uh, NaCl sodium chloride. It's a stable, necessary compound. So... If we marry on this basis, our marriage would always be the same. No distractions, no fluctuations, none of the uncertainties and emotions of love. But I... Oh, I, I know how you feel about love. It's, it's also my own conviction. For the scientist, there is no time for love. But it, 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 it's stupid to believe in generalizations. In our case, it would be a wonderful collaboration. Uh, a, a wonderful collaboration. Uh, don't you feel that? I feel that. And, and as for Poland, what little good you could do there, you can make up here tenfold on your own ground science. Science? Oh, what do you think I should do? It would, it would be a very fine thing, I believe, to pass our lives together with our common scientific dream, to work together constantly in our search, and any discovery that we should make, no matter how small, it, it would deepen the friendship we already have for each other and increase the respect we mutually feel. I can imagine no respect or friendship greater than I have for you now. I can imagine no future so full of promise as the one you offer. Then I suggest that you stay on in Paris with me. I believe you are right. I should like to remain in Paris very much. Thank you. Well, uh... Good night, Mary. Good night, Pierre. Oh, oh, uh, I, I forgot something. May, may I kiss you, Mary? Please do, Pierre. You, you are very lovely. Thank you, Pierre. In just a moment, we'll bring you the second act of Madame Curie, starring Greer Garson and Walter Pigeon. To enter a country, an enemy agent simply books a flight, provided, of course, that he can operate in the clear and that his papers are in order. Once an agent's cover is destroyed, however, he may then have to enter a country secretly. An agent on foreign soil may be bent on sabotage or assassination, but more likely his mission is to find security flaws and to steal information. The outcome of wars and the course of world history has changed because people who should have known better were careless. We bring you the second act of tonight's play, starring Greer Garson as Madame Curie and Walter Pigeon as Pierre. It's a month later. On a peaceful summer evening, Marie and Pierre Curie 
sit on the deck of a small river steamer that bears them back to Paris from their honeymoon. The music is lovely, isn't it? Lovely, yes. Pierre, when we get back to Paris, what shall I work on? Isn't there anything that particularly interests you? Oh, I thought a number of things interested me. But now somehow... What is it? Why did you stop? Oh, nothing. It's just an idea that went through my mind. Well, what was it? Well, do you remember the day that Dr. Becquerel showed us that rock? The pitch blend and the plate he had exposed to him? Yes. You know, Pierre, I can't get that out of my mind. Really? Why? Well, I know it's true that the rays are given off by something in the pitch blend. Mm -hmm. But I can't get over the feeling that there's more to it than that. That there's something beyond Becquerel's explanation. Like, um, like, like what, Marie? I don't know. What is this energy that the rays contain? Where does it come from? Oh, I, I suppose I'm being very foolish. Some of the greatest achievements of science have come through that same sort of challenging foolishness. But I wouldn't know how to start, Pierre. I, I wouldn't know what to do. Well, maybe, maybe I'll be able to help you. I'm very glad we're married to each other, darling. So am I, darling. Hello, oh, darling. Pierre. Hello, darling. I, you know, I, I, I could not remember if you said carrots or turnips. So I got both. Oh, I think we'll survive, dear. Your mother likes carrots and your father likes turnips. Marie, what's the matter? I know you hated to leave the laboratory so early today, but tomorrow's coming. Oh, I'm so discouraged, Pierre. What is it exactly that's wrong? I don't know. My measurements, they don't mean a thing. I know I must be making a mistake somewhere, but I don't know where. I've checked them 200 times. Ah, look, I'll go over them with you in the morning, dear. Let's not even think about the laboratory tonight. Promise? I promise. Hurry now. Off your coat and help me with the dinner. <laughs> No, Mary, if you ate some of these turnips instead of just staring at them, you wouldn't look so peaked. Just ignore him, my dear. Why, you look lovely. She's too thin. Oh. The air isn't treating her right. I know I'm not, Father. Between the house and the laboratory, well, it's, it's, it's too much. Laboratory. Women should stay home and have children. Oh, dear, he's off again. A woman without a child is a parasite, uh, a bloodsucker. Mary, are you listening to me? Of course, Father. A woman without a child is a bloodsucker. Yeah, but he didn't mean you, my dear. She's just the one I did mean. I. Uh, but uh... I am going to have a child. Mary, when, my dear, when? Soon, I hope. Uh, Marie. Well, well, the prospective father is going to say something at last. Uh, <laughs> Marie, the electrometer. Are you sure the insulation was dry? Yes, Pierre. Uh, did you, did you check the ground connection? I know. I thought you gave it to me in good condition. Yeah, but sometimes it will work loose. Yeah, that could be possible, couldn't it? In that case, my measurements may be correct. Yes. If we could get to the laboratory right now, we could... Oh. oh. All right, all right. Go ahead and check it. Father, it's, it's just that, well, Marie's had so many setbacks in her work. Don't stop to explain. Leave your guests and go. Oh, please forgive us running away. It's just that I've been waiting for so many months. Of course, dear. You and Pierre run along. I'll just be a second. Pierre, my coat, quick. Why didn't I think of that ground connection weeks ago? You know, Most Mama, sometimes I think that son of yours is slightly demented. It was awfully nice having dinner with you, Father. Nice having dinner with you, too. Happens every time. Every time. Well, give me my coffee, Mother. <laughs> Pierre, are you sure? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with the ground connection. Mary, I was wrong. I was so certain we'd find it. Mary, would you like to show me how you made your measurements? You wouldn't mind? Of course not. All right. Here, this rock. This is a piece of crude pitch blend. Oh, I've done this so many times I've lost count. Anyway, we know that the rays come from the uranium and the thorium contained in this crude ore. Correct. I put the crude pitch blend in this mortar. Has the mortar always been clean? Always, and I grind it up. Here in this dish now is ground pitch blend. I place it in the electrometer. Oh, will, you, will you draw the blinds, please, Pierre? And now I close the specimen case in the electrometer so there'll be no draft. Good. And I charge the electrometer. Now we'll find out how much energy the rays in the pitch blend have. Is that right? Right. What's the needle register? Ready? Ready. All right, read. The needle stops at eight. Eight. The same reading I've always had. Mm -hmm. Now... Here is pure uranium extracted from the same amount of pitch blend. Put this in exactly the same place, close the specimen case, charge the electrometer. Now we'll find out how much energy the rays in the uranium have. Right. Ready. Read. The needle stops at two. Same as always. 
We know then that the pitch plane with the uranium and thorium comes to eight, mm -hmm. and with uranium alone, it reads two. Right. Now we test the thorium. From the same amount of pitch plane? Oh, of course, yes. Now put that exactly in the same, in the same place, and I close the specimen case and charge the electrometer. Right. Ready? Read. The needle stops at, at two. Two. I, I, I don't understand. When the uranium and the thorium are in the pitch blend, the reading is eight. But individually, they only total four. Where are those four missing points? That's what I don't understand. Mm. I don't understand. You've made a chemical analysis of all the elements in the pitch blend? Well, of course, on the uh. blackboard over there. Uranium oxide, 75%. Thorium oxide, 30%. Lead sulfide, 3%. Silicon dioxide, 2%. Calcium oxide, 3%. Barium oxide, 2%. Iron oxide, 1%. Magnesium oxide, 0.99%. Other extraneous matter, 0.01%. Pierre... Yes? Our universe is composed of definitely known substances, isn't it? Elements that are fixed forever, inert, unchanging. We know that, don't we? All of our science is based on that, yes. Pierre, what if there... What if there were a kind of matter in the world we never dreamed of? What would that mean? Well, that would mean that our whole conception of the nature of matter would have to be changed. Oh, oh. it's cold in here. What are you thinking? Tell me. I... I don't quite dare. Go on, say it. What if we did not make a mistake in our measurements? What if there exists a matter that is not inert, but alive, dynamic? Look on the blackboard. Other extraneous matter. Do we dare think that our four missing points are in that one hundredth of one percent? Pierre, what have we discovered... A new element. An active element. A new element. The residue of the pitch plane. What was left over after I extracted the uranium and thorium? It must be contained in that residue. Where is it? Here, in this filter paper. Put it in the electrometer. Marie, if your four missing points are in this residue, our whole notion of the universe will be changed. Ready? Ready. Read. Give me your hand, on. Look. Look, Pierre. Four. The indicator needle goes to four. You found them, Marie. The four missing points. Madame Curie, you and your husband here ask that we, as directors of the University of Paris, furnish you with new laboratories and new equipment. Yes, monsieur, based on the reports which we have given you. You claim that you and Dr. Curie have detected the presence of a new element. Unfortunately, you furnish us with no convincing proof. We have demonstrated its existence experimentally. We've carried on our research intensively, except for five weeks in the autumn when our daughter was born. And yet, in all these months, you have come no closer to any proof as to the existence of... Uh, uh, what is the name you've given it? Uh, my wife has named it Radium, monsieur. Oh, yes, uh, Radium. This work would require a great deal of time, Dr. Curie? Yes, of course, Professor Roger. And uh, Madame Curie is young, inexperienced... And a woman. Gentlemen, it is perfectly true that Madame Curie is young, that she has not had the experience most of us have had, that she is a woman. But let me impress upon you, she is a most unusual woman. I might say, well, uh, a most unusual woman. I can assure you, gentlemen, that she is a remarkable scientist, as scrupulous as she is brilliant, yeah. and, and furthermore... Enough, yeah. Huh? Oh. We understand that you are convinced as to the reliability of Madame Curie's investigation. Entirely. And I have put aside my own research to devote all of my time to collaborating with her. Dr. Curie, the most we can do is to offer you the use of the shed near the School of Physics. It's not the most suitable place for your investigations, but unfortunately... The shed? The shed, gentlemen? If this abominable shack is available, it's only because no one else can be found who's willing to work in it. The roof leaks. It has no floor but the wet ground. In summer, it's as stifling as a hothouse, and in winter, it freezes. And do you imagine that I would permit my wife to work under these appalling conditions? Yeah, yeah. If you do, gentlemen, believe me, I... Huh? What? Are... Gentlemen, with my husband's permission, we shall be very glad to accept the shed. Uh, we shall be... Very grateful to have the shed, gentlemen. At first, it was sheer physical labor, infinitely too arduous for Marie. But through the bitter winter days, we put into operation an entire chemical plant, 
From the mines of Bohemia arrived the pitch black. Eight tons of it, sack after sack, which Pierre carried on his shoulders to the tank from which we planned to extract all known elements until only a few ounces remained. Out of eight tons, a few ounces of radium. The months ran into years, till there came a day at last when we reduced the original eight tons to two final elements. One was barium, and the other, the precious, elusive radium. Yes, the end of our task was in sight. All that remained was to separate these two last survivors. Somehow to separate barium and radium. The electrometer's charging, Pierre. Close the specimen case. Read it, Pierre. Read it. No separation, Marie. No separation. No separation. No separation. No separation. No separation. November 10th, 1899, second experiment. No separation. July 16th, 1900. 458th experiment. Radium still refuses to be separated from barium. We can do no more. Pierre, we're ready to try again. No, we're not ready. How much longer do you think you can drive yourself like this? How much longer do you think I can stand by and watch you destroy yourself, kill yourself? We're ready, Pierre. No, the world is done without radium till now. What does it matter if it isn't isolated for another hundred years? I... I can't give it up. If it takes a hundred years, it would be a pity. I'm going to see how far I can go in my lifetime. Give me the beaker. Thank you, Pierre. Here. Marie... Your hand. My hand? Those burns. Oh, they're nothing, Pierre, really nothing. But but how did you... I'll attend to them later. You'll see a doctor about them tonight. Tonight, tonight. tonight. Yes, darling, tonight, tonight. Are you ready now? I'm ready. Experiment 459. About these burns, Madame Curie... You say they haven't given you much pain? Only a little irritation at times, Doctor. Mm. I don't want to alarm you, Madame Curie, but it's possible that these burns might develop malignantly if you continue to expose them to these experiments. Malignantly? They might develop into a cancerous nature. I see. It is my advice, Madame, that you abandon your experiments immediately. Thank you, Doctor. Oh, my darling, your hands, your poor fingers. He only said the burns might develop. Might develop into cancer? No, 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 no. He said that possibly they might develop into a, into a cancerous nature, but only if exposed to radium. So if we're careful, darling, there's nothing to be frightened oh, about. I, I won't allow you to take such risks. I won't permit it. Pierre, there's something I must say to you, and then you shall decide as you wish. Very well. Since I left the doctors, I've been thinking... If radium has power enough to affect healthy tissue like mine, power enough to destroy tissue, Pierre, if it has this power, why hasn't it also the power to destroy unhealthy tissue? Do you realize what this might mean? It could heal, Pierre. All manner of diseases, maybe. Like cancer, even? Yes. Yes, Pierre, it might even do that. But, Marie... Oh, Pierre, can't you see how, how unimportant little things like this are compared with what it might mean? It might prevent great sicknesses, even deaths. Oh, Pierre, we can't stop now. We can't. Promise me, Marie. Promise me you won't I do... promise to take care of myself, darling. I promise to use every possible precaution. We'll... We'll try again, then, Marie. Oh, thank you, darling. Thank you. In a moment or so, we'll be back with Act Three of Madame Curie, starring Greer Garson and Walter Pigeon. In the early days of World War II, an organization was born. An organization which offered benefits to all members of the United States Armed Forces. 
It was formally opened in April 1942 at Madison, Wisconsin, and called the Army Institute. Its mission was to provide educational opportunities for millions of American youths entering the armed forces. The response from servicemen and women was immediate and enthusiastic. Later that year, the facilities were made available to the Navy, and in February 1943, the name was changed to United States Armed Forces Institute. This was the first USAFI. Today, there is a bigger, improved USAFI with five branches in various areas of the world. But the mission is still the same. The number one client is still the United States serviceman, receiving an opportunity to develop power through knowledge with USAFI. We continue with Act Three of Madame Curie, starring Greer Garson in the title role and Walter Pigeon as Pierre. Maddie's fingers healed, and though they did not find a way to separate radium from barium in a single process, they did discover a method of removing barium little by little in infinitesimal amounts. Do you know what this will involve, Marie? I know. Evaporations, countless evaporations, crystallizations. It will take months and months. Maybe years, Pierre. But someday nothing will be left but radium. So they began the thousands of separate operations, crystallizing and recrystallizing, until what was once eight tons of pitchblende was now contained in a solitary bowl half filled with a colorless liquid. Hour after hour, they wait for it to crystallize. Pierre, Pierre, what time is it? Oh, we must have fallen asleep. Uh, it's, it's five o'clock. It must be crystallized by now. Our radium, it must be there. Take the lid off the bowl, dear. You look first, Pierre. Well, well, tell me, tell me. Pierre? Look. Nothing. It's empty. Not a trace of anything. Not a grain, only the stain. What's happened, Pierre? Where's our radium? What have we done? Where is it, Pierre? I don't know. What did we do that was wrong? What could we have done? We've done nothing wrong. I can't stand it, Pierre. We've worked for years and years and years. It must be there. It must be there. Four long years in this shed. Four long years. There, 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 Marie. We're going home. We're human beings. We have a child and a home, and we're going to them. Doesn't she feel good? She's tired, darling. So tired her eyes couldn't stay open any longer. Would you tell me a story? Yes, dear. If you'll close your eyes. Now, it's about a wonderful treasure that was locked up in an enchanted stone. Isn't there a princess in it? A beautiful princess. She... she looked very much like your mother. And a prince, too. Now, only a man who lived all alone until the princess found him. Did they love each other? Very much. And one day, the princess told the man about this wonderful treasure. So they decided to search for it together. The princess knew that if they could get it out of the stone, it might let other people see the wonderful things that they had never been able to see before. So they worked very hard for a long, long time to try to rescue the treasure from the stone. But they grew very tired, and at last they knew that they would never be able to free the treasure from the enchantment of the stone. But they weren't sad about it because they knew that no matter how many disappointments they had, they would always go on together having the courage to take the many disappointments because they were together. And they lived happily ever after. Pierre, 
you awake? Darling, I thought you were asleep. I can't sleep. I can't accept it, Pierre. I can't. The radium. Darling, there are some things that you just must accept. Months and months ago, I... I knew we'd found the right process. If I only knew why we failed. I why, Pierre? No, I don't know. I don't know. Pierre. Pierre, that, that stain on the bowl. The stain? What we were expecting to find was a definite amount of radium. Yes. Something you could see and feel, about uh-huh. as much as a pinch of salt, you said. Yes. Pierre, what if it's... What if it's... Merely a question of amount. Huh? What if there's so little radium that even now we couldn't see it? What if... What if that stain, even if it was the merest, merest breath... Go on, go on. Pierre, could it be that that stain is radium? I'm getting up. I'm going to find out. Hurry, darling, hurry. It's so dark in here. Wait, I'll find a lamp. Here. Yes? Look, on the table. The bowl. Marie, Marie. It's glowing. The bowl is glowing in the dark. Do you know what that means? It's there. The radium, it's there. The stain in an empty bowl. It's there. It's oh. there, it's there. Oh, Pierre. Oh, Pierre. Woman scientist discovers amazing new elements. Scientists predict new era with discovery of radium. Curie's turned down millions for secret of radium. Doctor and Madame Curie give gift of radium to humanity. Curie is to receive Nobel Prize for radium. Marie. Yes, dear? You know what I'm doing? You're sitting on a chair in a beautiful garden far from Paris. You're having the first rest you've had for years. You know what else I'm doing? I'm walking through the new laboratory the university is giving us. <laughs> oh, it'll be wonderful to get back to work again. We've lost so much time. Oh, Pierre, the time we spent down here hasn't been lost. We've got our strength back. Yeah, that's true. You know, when we first came here, I used to have some fantastically morbid thoughts. How do you mean? Oh, I had a feeling that I, well, I didn't have much time to lose, that my days were, well, uh, well, that I mustn't waste them. Pierre, what a horrible thought. Marie, oh, darling, don't take it so seriously. It frightens me. Oh, I'm sorry I mentioned it. It was nothing. Pierre, if if one of us should ever go, the, the other couldn't go on alone. Couldn't be expected of us, could it? Oh, you're wrong, dear. If one should go, the other must work on just the same. But I, for one, have no intention of going anywhere except to our wonderful new laboratory. Yeah. Yes, dear. Are you... Are you proud of me at all, Pierre? Oh, Marie. Because I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud that sometimes I think I'll burst. You're a very great man, Pierre. Not the way the world means, but just you. Your kindness, your gentleness, and your wisdom. I love you, Pierre, so deeply. I never dreamed that... I'm so thankful, Pierre. That's what I want to tell you. That's what I hope you've always known. But what does it say in the newspaper, Grandpa? Tell me. Tell me. Well, give me a chance. The president and faculty of the University of Paris will present Pierre and Madame Curie with a fully equipped laboratory and staff with which to carry on the many experiments they have opened the gateway to. There will be a formal presentation of the laboratory at 6.30 tonight at which the world-famous couple will appear. Well, not bad, eh? Not bad. It's terrible. Daddy! Hello, darling. What's the matter with this house today? This place is in a turmoil and a rainstorm. Sit down and relax, Pierre. Relax. Where's Marie? I can't find her anyway. A house without a woman. I, 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 I don't understand. Marie! But she's upstairs, Daddy. Upstairs at this hour? She's having a fitting on a new dress for the ceremonies tonight. It's supposed to be a surprise. Oh, good, good. 
That, that, that's a very sound idea. Just remember, I didn't tell you. But how am I to remember anything today? And you like the gun, Pierre, really? Oh, I do very much, Marie. You ought to have some kind of a, of a, of a little ornament, hadn't you? Oh, nonsense. Yes, no. yes, uh, something bright. I've, I've seen them on women, and, and they look nice. Don't look at me like that. You're making me self-conscious. No, I was just thinking. Evening dress becomes you so. But there you are. We just haven't had the time, have we? Oh, listen to that. Our beautiful day ruined. It's pouring. Oh, it'll stop, dear. Don't worry. Well, I, I must be going. I have a hundred things to do today. I, I've made a list. I want to clean everything up and start fresh at the new laboratory in the morning. Just don't be late, darling. Professor Perrow's calling for us at six. I'll be here. And don't forget your rubbers. I won't. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye, Marie. <laughs> Do you uh, have anything else you could show me? Uh, earrings, perhaps? Oh, yes, monsieur. These, for example. Very lovely. Oh, yes. Yes, they are. And uh, what are these? These are garnets, monsieur. Really? Well, I, I hardly know which to... Uh... It could depend on the lady, monsieur. Is she blonde or... Uh... Oh, blonde, uh, definitely. Not not too blonde. I, Well, her, her hair is... Uh... Sort of gold, you know. Gold? Yes. And her eyes are gray. Very calm and gray. And her coloring is very, very lovely. Sort of a, of a smooth skin and, and nice, delicate coloring. And I don't know whether this would be of any help to you, but I believe the lady is quite beautiful. Ah, uh, yes, monsieur. I would say the garnets, by all means. Well, here are the earrings, Doctor. All wrapped up. Thank you. It's been such an honor, Dr. Curie. I didn't know at first it was you. Thank you for your help. She liked the earrings, I'm sure. Good day, monsieur. Monsieur, look out! You watch where you're going! Look out! Look out. Look out. my painful duty to tell you, Madame Curie, that your husband has been the victim of a street accident. He was instantly killed. He could have suffered no pain. Dr. Perrault is here to see you, Mary. Mary, it's your old teacher, dear. Dr. Perrault, you see just the same. She just sits seeing nothing, hearing nothing. Marie, forgive me if I intrude, Marie. I do so as Pierre's old friend and as your old friend. Marie, somewhere within yourself you must find the strength to carry on his work and your own. Marie, ten years ago you told me so often you were impressed by something that I said when you were in my class. I spoke of Newton and Galileo and I said that probably none of you would reach so high to catch a star on your fingertips. I was wrong. I have truly seen you reach into the high places of knowledge and catch a star on your fingertips. Marie, there are more stars. There is nothing more for me. Pierre is gone. They brought these home. This watch and chain. This piece of paper with reminders. CBL at Institute regarding insurance for laboratory workers. Go to printers, buy... Buy earrings for Marie. He was killed in front of the shop. Buying earrings for me. <laughs> she faltered for a moment, yes But then took up again the work for which she was born Remaining always at heart the humble student Haunted by dreams Regarding but lightly her international renown 
A quarter of a century later, the University of Paris observed the 25th anniversary of the discovery of radium. On that occasion, frail but still bright-eyed and eager was the wife of Pierre Curie. No one of us can do much for science or humanity, yet each of us perhaps can catch some gleam of knowledge which modest and insufficient of itself may add to man's dream of truth. It is by these small candles in our darkness that we see before us, little by little, the dim outlines of that great plan that shapes the universe. And I am among those who think that for this reason, science has great beauty. And with its great spiritual strength, will in time cleanse this world of its evils, its ignorance, its poverty, diseases, wars, and heartaches. Many years ago, an obscure poet of my native land set forth a creed which I have never forgotten. May I repeat his words to you now? Look for the clear light of truth. Look for unknown frontiers, new roads, even when man's sight is keener far than now. Divine wonder will never fail him. Every age has its own dreams. Leave then the dreams of yesterday and build the temples of the future. A great play calls for great artists, and here they are. Two stars who have given us so many memorable performances, Greer Garson and Walter Pigeon. Thank you, Bill. I'm sure Walter and I will always remember the pictures we made together. How could a man forget a girl like you, Greer? <laughs> Good night, Bill. Good night, and all our warmest thanks. This is the American Forces Radio and Television Service.